this week. Um, we have a very uh, interesting uh, discussion today. I think as, as the title suggests, it's really uh, about the, the impact of uh, technology on the delivery of education. And I think what we've seen over the, the last 18 months or so, uh, with well, more than 18 months now with the, the COVID-19 pandemic, that it's really accelerated the, uh, the use of technology in, in education, which was already an ongoing and pretty unstoppable trend. Um, I just, uh, as a way of background, my name is Stephen Irvin. I'm the founder and the editor of Week in China, which has been publishing uh, since 2009. Uh, we are a, a weekly publication that curates the news coming out of China uh, on the business sector, uh, in social news and cultural news. Um, and also, obviously, uh, we write about education too, which I think is one of the reasons why PBEC asked me to, to be the moderator of this panel, particularly given that um, China has been such a big uh, player in the so-called ed tech education technology sector in terms of its innovation and growth over the past few, few years. So what I'm planning to do today is uh, we have five excellent panelists who I've already had conversations with over the last few weeks and uh, know their areas of expertise and their interesting points to view. Um, so we're going to structure this in a sort of tripartite way. Uh, the first section I will conduct in terms of as a, like almost journalistic interviews where I will speak to each of the individual panelists on their area of, of knowledge and expertise within the, the varied education sector going from so-called K-12 school age through to uh, university tertiary and executive education. Um, then in the second part of the, the, the panel discussion, we will open it up more to a general discussion about some bigger themes where everyone will share their points of view, It'll be more of a kind of um, open debate, as it were, between the panelists on, on how they see things going. Um, and at that point as well, um, maybe members of the audience who, who have questions can use the Q&A section to, to uh, type in their questions that we can deliver to the panelists as well in the, the last section of the, of the uh, discussion. Um, so just briefly, um, what I plan to do is, is start, as I say, doing one-on-ones uh, with the individual panelists, the five panelists, four of whom are in Asia, one who's in, um, in London. And, uh, and before I do the, each of the you know, Q and A's, I will do a little bit of a, an introduction to the person concerned uh, who we're talking to, but just to quick, give a quick overview of the, the panelists, we have, um, as I say, five panelists. We have um, Mariana Ku, who's the chairperson and CEO of CTE, based in Hong Kong. Um, Chris Geary, who's the co-founder and CEO of BSD Education, again, based in Hong Kong. Uh, Brian O'Reilly, who's the chair of the Education and Training Working Group of the Vietnam Business Forum, who's based in Vietnam. Um, we have uh, David Brown, the Director of Executive Education at Imperial College Business School in London, obviously based in London. And uh, Christina Maria Schoenleber, uh, Schoenleber, who's a Senior Director of Policy and Research Programs at uh, APRU, um, the Association of Pacific Rim Universities. So um, I thought it'd be a good idea to start given the, the news flow this year, um, talking to, um, to Mariana, who's, who's really a, a great expert on the, the Chinese education technology ed tech sector. Mariana has um, been CEO of the Research Study Education Group, and she was an award-winning um, equity research analyst working with the likes of uh, CLSA and uh, Lehman Brothers. Um, she worked on um, 12 IPOs in the sector, in the education and consumer sector. So she has a great deal of experience about the investability of, of the ed tech sector and, and how it's being, how it was financed in China and the innovations going on. And she also wrote a book in called Investing in Dragons, Education Industry and Capital Markets. So I think when it comes to um, talking about ed tech China and what's been going on in the news this year, which you've probably heard about, she's a good person to get us started off. So, so Mariana, just, you know, um, 
going straight into it, really, you know, we all have been reading the, the newspapers this year. And in the summer, there was really a big announcement about, you know, how China was changing a lot of its regulations and relating, relating to how how children in schools could could be given sort of private education, a lot of which was being done through uh, ed tech. Um, can you maybe just talk us through a little bit about, you know, over the last 10 years or so, how the ed tech sector has really boomed and innovated in China and how we got to the point this summer where there was a, almost a sort of, um, uh, I don't want to use a backlash, but a complete change of direction, which has obviously caused a lot of, um, headlines. Sure. Um, thanks, Stephen. Again, I'm definitely very excited and, and honored to be here today. I guess to answer the question, maybe I'll just go a little bit back in history, right? Um, I think for the past 10 years or so, um, we only had, a, well, I guess back in 2010 or so, right, we only had a, a handful of education companies listed and mostly in the US uh, for the Chinese ones, that, that's what I'm um, referring to. And those were not really gaining too much traction and they are not, there are only a handful of them, so they didn't really get much attention, I think, from the buy side, so to speak, the investment funds or the investors overall, but, um, but they're there. Um, so they are a couple of sides meaningfully sizable ones that actually got big enough to be listed, but there's not too much of critical mass from an investor's point of view until we get to more like 2013, 14, when um, we started getting a couple of IPOs coming through Hong Kong. I think that's when, you know, tractions are really gaining um, through the sector from the buy side. Um, I think people started to look a lot closer. There are things more like a specialist in education, so to speak, uh, following the sector. So I think that's when um, both listed or like investment funds that are actually following listed companies or more private equity funds that are looking more at private deals started to really um, look at the sector and look at the demographics and look at the kind of underlying fundamentals of why this sector could be interesting. Um, from my perspective, I think um, there are a couple of characteristics for the Chinese market at least um, that are, are making it really interesting. It's obviously demographics, um, it's huge population, um, um, income level is really growing and hitting more of a, a critical kind of critical point of um, accelerating growth in China. Um, but I think there's also a cultural aspect for education that makes it uh, very interesting among the Chinese and also Asian cultures. Is um, scholarship is highly respected, so I think people or parents are willing to um, spend quite a bit of money just to invest in education. So it's perceived as an investment. Um, so I think that makes it very attractive in, from that perspective. And overall, for for, um, for China as a country, I think the, the structure of the industry also makes it interesting because it's the Gaokao um, test at the end of um, the high school graduation where people actually take the exam and then apply for university. Um, and there is one unique, I guess, um, kind of supply demand dynamics in the education space is they, each year is talking about, we talk about 18 to 90 million um, students that at the age of around 18, so kind of high school graduation age, but only half of them will actually take the Gaoka exam. So they, basically half of them would be interested to pursue further education, but only around half could actually get end up getting into um, a regular kind of four year bachelor's, like undergraduate program, like a regular degree that we would be kind of thinking of. So it's a limited capacity of that, which makes the whole, um, I guess, the system very competitive because people are always hoping to get into the top universities and then you work backwards. Right? You, work, you need to get into a really good school in high school and the middle, middle school, and then you kind of keep going backwards. So I think that unique dynamic and, and culturally is highly valued, makes um, the kind of the foundation for the landscape very, very interesting. And that's where um, we see the education as more of um, an experience and a product that, you know, that would be capturing a lot of consum consumer dollar at the, or, or from a consum um, consumption standpoint, it's a consumption story. So that's what investors are looking for. So I think back um, starting in 20, um, kind of 13, 14, when Hong Kong started to getting a couple education IPOs going through and people started to look at comms, like comparable companies and start to uh, follow the Chinese names in the US. And I think that's when a lot of critical mass coming through um, and a lot of the investors going PE, family offices, which is also a, a commonly 
um, common interest uh, area that we are getting is a lot of the family offices follow this space as an impact investments. Um, so I think, yeah, so to, to kind of put this out, the way I look at the education space is, is kind of in the K-12 segment, you have the higher education segment and you have obviously EdTech that's kind of overlaying the whole um, industry. Um, I think the, to, to, I guess going back to more of the reason, right? Um, reason changes is um, COVID obviously changed the game for EdTech. I think um, in 2015, 16, when we started getting a lot of invest, investors interested in the segment, PEs, VCs are, are starting to look at that. Corporates are also looking into ad tech, looking to invest a lot into how to, or thinking about how to actually uh, maximize profit or really um, uh, broaden the reach to the lower tier cities, right? So ad tech has been more of a platform. They're looking into actually maximize their reach um, and also um, fix the, fix, so to speak, to, to solve the problem of um, reaching lower tier city students um, and, and delivering high quality teaching resources to them. Because um, a lot of the times the best teachers usually see in the top top tier cities. So I think that's um, that's when 2015, 16, a lot of the companies started looking at that P dollars, VC dollars, also looking into this segment. COVID actually really helped a lot. I think in the past two years or so with um, encouraging people to go and shifting from offline to actually trying, well, and, and basically kind of have no choice in, in some of the times last, last two years, right? We, we are basically locked down that you have to go online to actually continue your, your studies. So I think that helped a lot with shifting the consumers online. Um, the VC, PEVC dollars, I mean, I think of all the market research have been pointing that um, the last year, especially for 2020, it's been a pretty record year. But um, for China, at least uh, for this year, though, because of the regulations that um, Stephen uh, was mentioning, I think that's really um, changing the, the game, at least for um, a lot of the Chinese uh, PEVCs and listed companies also got affected. They're mostly, I think, essentially two rounds of regulations that came through this summer uh, for the Chinese education space. Uh, one is um, a, a pretty much a final document for the law for promoting private education. There's been a lot of um, news flows in the past couple of years talk about, you know, how should we regulate this? Um, on the one hand, it feels like the government wants to encourage private capital to come in to help accelerate the growth of the sector. But on the other hand, I think the government also doesn't want it to be too commercialized. Um, so there's always this fine balance. Um, I think essentially um, what has really come through to the market is um, there's a lot more tighter restrictions for K-12 segment. Um, M&A is a lot allowed. Um, they don't really want them to access the capital markets um, to use that to really drive a lot of growth or, or even to um, more extreme extent of monopoly in certain cities. So that's kind of basically what the government is trying to avoid uh, as a scenario. Um, and also they don't want this to be too commercialized for young kids, I guess, that's just for schools. That's just a bad, not really a, a good perception. Um, so I think that's um, so, so the, the general perspective or general atmosphere is higher education is a lot more favored uh, for private capital to go in. The policies are also showing that it's a lot more favorable, um, essentially drawing uh, a path for, fine for higher education to be for profit in China. And the second round, I think that's um, getting even more attention in the markets because the bigger list of education names are mostly in the after school tutoring segments. Um, and that's where the second wave of regulation changes really hit them. Um, is when, when the government is essentially coming out and say that, well, for academic tutoring, this is, um, you shouldn't really be doing it it's very commercialized and, and, and for profit. And they are at one point, um, uh, tens of billions of uh, market cap, right? So that's, um, really huge companies and, and uh, spending tons of marketing dollar into um, acquiring sort of like student acquisition, customer acquisition. So I think that's really getting a lot of concerns. Um, so that change in regulations uh, really hit the public market. Um, and, and I think there are a lot of underlying factors um, under all these changes or kind of driving all these changes. Um, there are a lot of speculations, but I think it's a combination of a bunch of factors, including common prosperity, including um, the, the encourage or, or the government's per, um, initiative to actually drive population growth, um, and including what I just mentioned on how commercialized um, this sector has become. That's a little bit front of point. So I think I will, um, sorry, it's a bit of a long-winded answer, but I hope um, that actually- Do you think, do you think um, Mariana, going back to the, the common prosperity theme that, 
the one of the the things lying behind this is that the government became worried that because Chinese parents were so passionate about getting their kids into good universities, good schools, etc., parents were spending rather a large chunk of their disposable income on these education, um, basically supplemental private sector education classes, after school classes, and. The whole thing had turned into a bit of a, you know, to use a better, for want of a better term, a bit of an arms race, that it was almost like everyone was spending more and more and more. And as you say, there's always going to be a finite fixed number of places anyway. So was there a concern that there was too much money being allocated into this sector? And that's why the government felt it had to intervene. Um, I don't think the government is worried about all oh, the household um, is allocating a really big chunk of it. I think I think this just culturally is perceived as um, an investment for it. like education is like a learning for innovation and, and research and I think it's not it, like essentially just households are allocating too much money but it's just like because the sector has become a bit too commercialized it feels like um, kids from kind of underprivileged families find it really hard so it's a bit of an intergenerational inequity concern of that it's just like or if you are not born into a privileged family, you can't be afford all these children, then it makes it harder to get into a good school. And then, you know, you just one step leads to another. So um, I think they just want a bit of a balance. So essentially what they are encouraging now is, well, the schools should really take up, take back up the responsibility of actually making sure all the kids actually are on the same page with what they're supposed to be learning instead of kind of delegating that responsibility to after school children companies. Or if they are doing that, that might really be not for profit. And I think there are a lot of discussion now talking about how um, if the private sector is help, stepping in to help with this, you know, students catching up on the homework, then maybe the surplus or so instead of a profit, but that surplus should really be um, look into be built upon and, and looking into how to use that surplus to help other kids. So it's um, a more charity fund angle into that structure on how to continue to contribute to the sector. So I think they still want to um, ensure there's good quality education per se, but it's just make sure that everyone is not too far apart in terms because of their family situation. So, so just summarizing what you were saying, basically the government was concerned that the current system or the past system was not necessarily egalitarian, it was a bit more regressive. So they, you know, so what, what does this mean though, in terms of innovation? Because obviously beforehand, the, the Chinese market was you know, on the ed tech sector was innovating probably at the very leading edge globally because there was so much resource and money and VC money and brains and things going into the Chinese ed tech sector. The cover, what's happened now with the government stepping in? Has that slowed down the innovation as well? Um, I think the innovation process could be, you know, impacted in that sense. Well, we're already seeing the dollars, right? In the first like couple of quarters, we're already seeing the VC money going to ad tech already shrinking for, or slowing down, not really, uh, per se, in terms of growth for Chinese market, because obviously investors are worried about, you know, how to actually recoup and get their returns, right? There's no exit, you can't really do IPOs, and or there's just so much uncertainty on what could happen in the next couple of years when, you know, the early stage investments mature. So investors are scared. Um, and... Well, the big giants that we were talking about that actually saw their market caps collapsing uh, massively this year, they have been actually big investors in the ad tech space too, right? So they were giant companies, they got good cash flow, they have been kind of sitting a lot of the fun, um, startup companies in ad tech, right? And with this, you know, change in regulatory landscape, um, we are seeing the investment flows actually changing. So I would think that, yeah, I think the innovation speed would actually, you know, slow down a little bit. Okay. Yeah, for simple future, yes. Well, maybe we should change tack a little bit at this point, and I'll move on to um, to Chris, Chris Geary, who's the co-founder and CEO of BSD Education, which is a is an education software company. So it's a slightly different perspective that Chris brings to this, to Mariana's perspective, more in the kind of more of the investment side in some ways. Um, Chris, you're doing the actual nuts and bolts of actually educating kids in the classroom, and you are working not just around Asia, but around the world. Um, so uh, just to, to get started, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your company so that people in the audience understand a bit more about what you do, because primarily you're teaching digital skills through software, I think, right? Yeah, correct. Um, so Stephen, what uh, BSD Education was, was founded by myself and, and my co-founder, Nikki Kemchandani in 2013. Um, and we actually originated as a, as a teaching academy 
really. We were we were teaching directly to students. Um, we we taught young people and we taught adults, and it was really in response. I mean, in the world of digital skills education, 2013 is the very early days. Um, and we went to many organizations and in those days they looked at us like we had three heads when we started to suggest the idea of educating on digital skills. Um, obviously things have come a long way since then, but when we started, yeah, we, we really looked to reach the broadest possible demographic and get an idea about where was there an important problem that we could solve with an approach. And, you know, one of the greatest challenges we found was you've got, call it future opportunities, which are significantly dependent upon digital skills. Um, and that dependence is growing. Um, at the same time, in 2013, you saw an educational landscape with a complete and utter absence of digital skills. And so within that, we said, well, we will look at how do we, how do we take what we've learned from running a digital skills academy to create a solution that will enable the capacity to teach digital skills. And this is to enable educators, and I'm saying educators, not teachers, because I'm talking about formal and informal avenues of education, but to enable educators with no prior technical experience, how can we deliver a solution that can bring them to the table and enable them to teach digital skills or to include digital skills in other types of lessons. So that's really what we've done over the last eight years in, in BSD. And to put it in perspective, you know, we started the organization in 2013, we launched our solution in 2017. So, you know, we did, we did put a lot of time, a lot of research into, into how we would construct uh, our solution. So when, when you say digital skills, maybe you can go a little bit more into the granularity of what that means, for example, sure. Does it mean like teaching kids how to create great PowerPoint presentations or whatever? How, what does digital skills mean to you and your software? Yeah, and so I would say digital skills is really less about the specific software that you're using or the specific, let me go maybe even more, the specific technology. You know, you could be creating a solution with a coding language. You could be creating a solution using a design suite. You could be, um, you know, applying a, a piece of software in a different way than it's traditionally been conceived for. Um, what, what we look at is digital skills having three core components, the first of which is the hard skills of technology. OK, um, and if I when I talk about summarizing hard skills of technology, because, you know, you you go one layer below hard skills and you're already kind of into an alphabet soup um, of an inexhaustible list of different technologies I could refer to. Um, what we try to do is I say, well, there are, there are tech, the hard skills of technology that have a relationship to the creation of content that are hard skills of technology that have a relationship with data analysis and interpretation. And there are hard skills and technology that relate to designing user experience. And so you can then, you can build your bi bilateral lattice or your trinomial off the back of that. But those are the hard skills. Now a core feature of the hard skills of technology is they're getting more complex. They're getting bigger. They're getting less something that one individual can themselves really be a jack of all trades. And so in relation to that, that means that the hard skills of technology are inextricable from the soft skills of technology. As a technologist, you have to be able to work with others. You have to be able to communicate with others. A technology team is incredibly diverse, incredible, incredible range of different types of people. And so the soft skills of, 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 of uh, soft skills fit strongly into digital skills. And then the third part is as well, the values of technology. So we talk about our care values in BSD, curiosity, adaptability, resilience, and empathy. Um, and again, we, I, I've, I've been talking about empathy as a, as, a, as, a, as a critical facet of digital skills education since we started BSD and people found it amusing at the beginning. But nowadays, you know, when we look at the ramifications of some solutions that have been created in the absence of empathy, you know, we see and we, we bear the consequences of that nowadays. So, you know, those values of technology, we want responsible technologists, we want impactful technologists. And so for me, digital skills is something that is a combination of hard skills, soft skills and values um, to really prepare I've, a, a person of any age for the future, because we're not only going to be talking about young people here. 
I'm just trying to imagine, obviously taking this out of the context of COVID and also issues of sure. COVID, but in a, in a sort of normalized world, there's let's say 20 children sitting in front of computer terminals or laptops using your software in a classroom. There's a teacher there as well. How, how does the teacher interact with your software? Does your software disintermediate teachers or how does that work? No, so we, we, what our, a core focus of our solution is actually to do quite the opposite. It's really to enable the educator is to involve the educator um, and so and I mean that model that that's the that's one of the barriers that we've really had to overcome over the last few years is that that didactic picture of a classroom with students behind the screen and, and, and an educator at the front of it and how does the educator fit into that and you know as things like student agency are becoming bigger trends in education systems around the world what you're seeing within that is you're seeing um, software educational software that the students will 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 learn which really take guide them through solving problems and their way where they're working on a project focused or a project based learning experience from our our underlying pedagogy for all for all curriculum that we create is from a constructionist leaning which for those of you who are listening that say what's that it's it that's the it's the fundamental educational philosophy underlying uh lego uh for as an example and so what we then have at the front is you've got an educator um but now the thing is that educator typically would be in the middle would be sitting surrounded by their students would have their would be at the back of the room would might not even be there at all but what that educator is doing is guiding those people those young people or those learners through the process with the power of context one thing we have as adults which younger learners don't have is we have a context and that's generally something that educators are comfortable with if i ask a mathematician do you want do you do you have a context of mathematics in the real world they will say yes if i say to them are you a strong technologist they're highly likely to say to me no so then to to bridge between that our software scaffold so we provide the data about the learning that the students are doing, the progress that all of the students are making, but of course they'll be in different places in that learning experience. And what we want when the students are maybe going into an instructional experience, because students say, oh, I need a particular skill for a particular solution, then the student could choose to pursue that skill, you know, within the overarching program of learning. And I, I think, so what you're seeing now is you're going to see with the approach with approaches like the one we've seen we, we've taken we're seeing not disintermediation of teachers a changing role of the teacher but then i think a, a much much greater ongoing importance of instructional design and the idea of curation of the program of learning um, when we're thinking about the experiences that students of any age will have through uh, at their educational journeys so Crick, is your software able at this point or is it going in this direction where it can actually measure whether the students are engaged and paying attention and give feedback to teachers about that in terms of that sort of data so that is a very very big question um because you know there are the, the measurement of engagement of a student when it's when we're thinking about visual cues with you know with with uh, artificial intelligence algorithms or where we're thinking about verbal cues to 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 measure that those are very developmental technologies and full of bias and uh, and not really well culturally adjusted at the moment so i think anyone who's sitting here in the world at the moment saying they're doing a good job on that is point blank lying maybe they're trying to push their share price up a bit but um what we are doing uh what we're looking at is um you've got a, a learning journey of a student and you know one of the things that we're researching actively is as a student learns because we provide our software solution we provide content and we have support and you know never never underestimate the value of human centric support in education um, but then under that we're looking at how can we surface the evidence of the learning that has occurred and something that i'm very passionate about and i think this relates in the long term to potentially evolving systems of assessment um, and evolving perspectives upon suitability and that's really looking at surfacing the learning as it happens you know the whole concept in learning of completion actually goes in quite a direct contradiction to the way the real world works nowadays we don't really complete things in the real world anymore but often for a course to count you, you have to finish it 
And so that doesn't always make sense to us. And so what we're doing now is we're looking at what aspects of learning can we surface? So what evidence can we do and what data points can we measure to evidence soft skills, to evidence communication, collaboration, to evidence socially responsible solutions, to evidence, evidence student reflection, and putting all of that together in more of a holistic profile of the learner or holistic transcript of the learner, more than necessary right now trying to to automatically measure cues that would that would necessarily say okay this this person was engaged in a class um we're looking we're going down a different route in terms of our of our bigger picture and our measurement of the success of the learning that's happening and your um your software now is spreading all around the world can you just tell us briefly how many education markets you're in how many schools how many so students? yeah we're in 16 countries now um and across those countries we work in the developing world and we work in the developed world we work with uh, we treat uh, international schools as a country so one of those 16 counts as international schools um, because we treat them as a country unto themselves um, but then in other countries we're in public schools as well as well at national system private schools too uh, and we have I think we're just over 70,000 students now, uh, over 4,000 educators, but these are all, you know, these are all learners and educators from, from very different and diverse backgrounds around the world. So, uh, you know, that's where we, we see that growing. Uh, major places for us where we've, we've seen, you know, growth in the, in the past years has been um, obviously the international schools, um, Greater China, Japan has, is, uh, is, has been a big market for us for the last couple of years. And then uh, in the United, the United States has been a major market. Going forward, uh, we're seeing traction around Australasia, um, the United Kingdom, uh, and then South Asia, particularly. So a uh, final thing before we quickly move on to the next, uh, next speaker, uh, panelist rather. Um, your pricing model is quite, quite interesting because obviously your delivery of your products is has a, effectively, you've already sunk the cost. It's, a, it's a, almost a flat cost. But you believe that that that's basically, if you're trying to target um, schools in very poor countries, like say, for example, Bhutan, they should pay a lot less than the richest private schools in the US. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm quite open about the fact that, you know, we, when, when we're looking at, the, at a school with a $400 million endowment, then we're going to be charging them $25, $30 a student, you know, and that's, that's for, for, for with what we do, that's top of the market. When we're in a country like Bhutan, you know, we're looking at a buck, a buck 50 a student. And that's, you know, that's the reality. And for us, as, as, as we, you know, we, I see BSD and what we do as a, you know, we are a for-profit organization, but we are also of the mindset of a social enterprise. And so as we create scale, you know, we create margin. Margin enables us to bring the price down for all students, including in, in the wealthiest organizations. But, you know, right at the outset where we can put our product into a country at a dollar, uh, at a, dollar a year a kid, then we'll do it. Great. OK, well, just quickly moving on to Brian, Brian O'Reilly, the chair of the uh, Education and Training Working Group of the Vietnam Business Forum. So, I mean, I mean Brian, you, you've been based in Vietnam for quite a while now in the, in the university sector, and it's, it's an area you know obviously very well. Um, I'm wondering you know, if you can maybe give us a little bit of a flavor of how Vietnam has coped with the COVID lockdown and how education has absorbed technology as a way of dealing with the, the pandemic and accelerating its usage. Yeah, well, um... It came as a little bit of a shock in Vietnam because um, at the beginning of last year, I think it was in March or something, um, I remember organizing classes on a Friday afternoon and basically face-to-face -face classes and one hour later, everything was shut down. Um, that's how quickly it came. And then that was the first wave. And then recently, as I've just to told you beforehand, um, we're still um, in somewhat of a lockdown, but we had five months of basically total lockdown. And most education uh, institutions won't go back to face-to-face, -face, probably until after the Lunar New Year. So it has been quite severe here. Um, I think what happened, one of the things that we had to learn very quickly, or people had to learn very quickly, was you know you talk about learning management systems, but 
before COVID, a learning management system was something that ma you manage like Moodle, Blackboard, whatever. It was something behind the scenes. It wasn't there for actually delivering classes. And that, was, that came, I think, as a big shock to a lot of people um, in the, uh, with the first um, lockdown was that basically, how do I go now to teaching online? And how do I make online teaching um, interesting? How do you keep the class awake? Now, for me, it was easy enough because the bit of teaching I do is with adults. So I, at least you've got some chance with adults. But you can imagine in K to 12, especially at the K end of it, how difficult it would be to try and have online teaching. And I've heard some um, stories there. But um, for me personally, um, I was sitting around and I actually volunteered to take on some classes. And it was quite interesting that how you could adapt technology to try and give the students as close to the same learning experience as they would have been getting in the classroom. And what I found was that you, the, the learning management system, one I used early on and it's pretty, um, was um, Google Classroom combined with Zoom, combined with specific software like project management software. So you soon, you soon figured out how to move, um, how, how to sort of get the interaction in the classroom. And, um, and I know Mariana and Chris have talked about this and there's a lot of technology out there. But I found it quite interesting that you could actually start mirroring a real classroom reasonably closely. And I think the big saving grace was um, breakout rooms. If you didn't have breakout rooms and working in teams, well, then you basically lost a class after a couple of hours. So as you can imagine, educators adapted um, to certain degrees. Um, some people just really couldn't adapt to online. Of course, then after that, uh, after that, um, op things opened up again. Some people just very quickly, some educators very quickly went back to, well, now we're face to face again. We can forget all of that. Um, it's over with. And that was a terrible um, um, decision to make. Whereas I found, hang on, um, technology now can supplement what I'm doing. It can supplement it very efficiently. And um, basically, I kept using technology in any class I've done since. I kept using the technology. It was a great way of adding value to the face-to-face. -face. And um, again, I'm talking about using, you know, a pretty basic level, but it was um, it was great. And then, of course, when we came to the second and the major lockdown, the people that had started embracing technology, learning how to use it, learning how to be able to teach online were the people or the institutions that really survived well in um, the second um, um, lockdown. And I think that was a big thing that um, then it, people realized, educators realized, educational institutions realized, we can't go back. It has to go forward. And no matter what we do now, we have to incorporate technology into it and um, not to drag it on too long and my own personal views on this is that basically we have to we have to look at we have to look at um, the digitization of learning um, we we mentioned in a chat at the beginning about there's so many online um, learning um, platforms where you can go in and learn things I use LinkedIn to as for example not just the only one but I'm in LinkedIn, I can use LinkedIn Learning. And I think one of the challenges um, facing um, education institutions, particularly traditional education institutions, is that if you stick to bricks and mortar, you're sticking to a business model that is now be going, going to become less, less and less relevant. And why should we be dragging students, um, particularly you know, adults, um, across cities into classrooms for face-to-face -face learning when you could um, supplement that you know with with digital learning so I think it's actually quite exciting um, quite challenging but the the future is um, with digital learning and that's the way it's going to go and I think you might find that in 
five or ten years, I think particularly young people are going to say, well, um, I want to study in this course or this program when in the UK, in America or wherever, and they can do it online. Um, you, you can do a lot of, you know, we talked about IT, Chris talked about technology. Well, you can study with Microsoft, with Google, Apple or whoever. They've all got all of these online classes. Um, and I think to the other thing, and uh, Mariana talked about, you know, the, what would you say, um, getting to disadvantaged people. And I had a chat just earlier today with a guy who was talking about how, how um, you can now dumb down computers just to put on basic technology that can, people can use in less developed areas. So you don't have to have delay. So old computers now can be used. And I think companies like Google are um, put, you know, using technology that doesn't need high capacity computers. And that way it can get out to the people in the countryside because one of the problems um, we had um, across Vietnam was that in the cities you have some chance with internet, but in many places in the countryside, having online classes, the kids either didn't have computers or the, the internet wasn't available or it was not available um, at a, a level that would be useful. So, and I, I'm not sure, I'm sure um, Mariana would talk more about China, but in Vietnam, the government now um, are pushing. They realize, the digitization of government, the economy, education is the way to go. And um, so, yeah, it's it's a bit like if you don't adapt to it, then you're going to get left behind. And I think that's the big challenge for education, people in education, education institutions. It's not going to go back. It's only going to go forward. I think, Brian, when we had our conversation, you used a very good term, which was you, you believe in blended learning. And by that you mean you think there should be a, a, a technology component to the delivery process. But for example, we're talking about MBA courses and you were saying that you don't think students would ever want to have a purely online experience with MBA because you feel they value being face to face with you know, the class and forming networks, social networks. Can you talk a bit about that? Well, yeah, there was actually a survey done recently by this HR company on on, on education that I was involved in. And um, face to face was still about 54% people wanted face to face, but it was 40, 40, in the high 40s, there were a lot of people said, we'd, we'd like, we like digital learning. But what I think when we say blended learning is, yes, you do need, you do need the human interaction if possible, you know what I mean? So I, I think what, what, what we need to look at is um, how you how you blend the digital components and the face to face the components to get the best out of everything. Um, it's one of the things I learned um, was um, was that um, in the first lockdown was well I can just record the lecture. I mean I don't have you know so why go why bring a whole lot of students to a classroom you know and um, I. Ho Chi Minh City or um, Saigon is about 12 million people and the normal times the traffic is pretty horrible. Um, when you could do a lot of it at home. So maybe you have, you know, you have a, at the beginning of, we'll say, a, a, a module or a course, you have face to face, then you then maybe somewhere in the middle, somewhere at the end. But have a mixture, but not just dragging people to a classroom to do what you can do virtually. Don't you know what I mean? And, you know, as I said, you know, I'm using, you know, I, I had pretty good results with, you know, just the basic use of technology. So um, as the technology improves and people like me get to know how to use that, you know, even more advanced technology, I think the need for face-to-face -face will be less, but there will be that need. Um, to have it, but I think blended learning is the way to go. Um, it'll be more economical for both the students and the education institutions. You need less rooms, um, and you can you can get a lot more students with a lot less cost. Yeah, you know, and yeah, it, it, it must be the way to go. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Brian. Let, let's move on to David Brown, who I, I think you can probably see when he comes on screen from his, his fireplaces in London. Um, so David's the Director of Executive Education at Imperial College Business School, and prior to that had a, a long stint um, helping to build up the credibility and reputation of London Business School's offering the, the Executive Education. Um, so, so David, just quickly asking you just to start off with, um, I, I noticed you offer at Imperial online and virtual courses. What, what's the difference between online and virtual in terms of how you deliver those courses? So uh, I think definition of terms isn't quite helpful. So um, online covers a multitude. So online can be largely asynchronous. Um, so that means there is a um, no learners are learning wholly in their own time. Um, and virtual tends to talk about delivery online, but with a, a live tutor or professor. The, um, so that's a broad definition, but in some ways, like, like most definitions, they obscure more than they, uh, than they reveal, because your really great learning design needs to be interactive. Um, um, Brian commented on after two hours you've lost uh, lost students. Uh, I don't know. I think my sense is that time is getting shorter and shorter. Um, we think about children having a low attention span. Actually, I think uh, people a little bit more advanced in their careers have even shorter attention spans. So we actually need to break up and ensure that we've got collaborative activity um, all the way along, even if it's sort of broadly asynchronous. You can do a lot of collaborative activity as we all do in our day to day jobs. Okay, great. And so I'm kind of curious how you've seen the student intake change with the advent of technology and COVID. Have you seen your student intake become more globalized because technology has made it easier for you to get applicants from around the world rather than just geographically nearby? Oh, absolutely hugely. So we more than tripled, I think, our, uh, our learner base because uh, you know, previously the travel was a um, you know uh, travel was a prohibitive. Um, so we're now seeing participants from uh, Indonesia, or, uh, uh, Vietnam, Nepal, uh, Costa Rica. You know, which hugely enriches the uh, the learning journey, and, and it also significantly uh, increases access. Um, Mariana had an interesting point, which is. Uh, most of the best professors are living in the major cities. Well, if you're not living in a major city, then how do you access that? Um, and so I think the online learning has been quite transformative in terms of access. And that's probably a topic we'll talk about, talk, talk about more. And also, I guess, you know, it means that people can structure around their own time zone as well. They don't have to be locked into the, the London curriculum timetable, I guess. Well, I think that's right. So if you have childcare responsibilities, for example, then you have, um, uh, that's often been a barrier to, uh, to, to certainly travel, um, but also, also learning. There's also, we've seen in um, this migration of value in many, many industries to some of the technology pioneers. And if you're not working uh, in one of those uh, companies, uh, within that industry, whether it's automotive, computing, healthcare, then it's often quite difficult to continue to um, to develop one's skills. And sometimes the budgets simply aren't there, and the time is not there for learning. So this is a great way of improve, improving access uh, more broadly. And also, I'm guessing that it, it sort of gets rid of issues in terms of visas, which have become a big issue in terms of education as well, right? Indeed, it does. Indeed, it does. Although um, the UK government, um, I'm not going to talk about the UK government, but one thing that's helpful <laughs> is that um, is that um, um, uh, students with on the degree side get automatic uh, visas before they have a job, which is is a recent innovation, which is which is helpful. I think in our in our prior conversation as well, you, you mentioned the fact that um, you don't think that all online all online, all online education is of a, on a par as such. You think that some of it is very sloppily designed and, and there is a difference between good and bad online education. Maybe you could speak to that a little bit. So the, um, 
there are some challenges with online learning and taking a lecture and um, transplanting online simply doesn't work for in many, many environments. And particularly with, I, I want to use the word executives bright, quite broadly, people who are um, uh, non-degree courses, because it's the ability to interact is simply not there. And the ability to spend hours, we do it and we're doing it now, uh, hours and hours on screen is very challenging. And so in some ways, doing in all ways almost, doing online learning is much more demanding than doing what traditional face-to-face -face learning. The learning segments need to be broken up into a very small uh, moments of a few minutes long. It needs to be very, very interactive. The lecturer is not walking around the classroom and as uh, Chris was talking about, those non-verbal cues are completely uh, absent. So there's a huge art in designing engaging, simple, uh, collaborative learning. And um, you know, many people have improved their capabilities in that area, but a lot of learning is still not very, still not very good. So um, um, I think we will see a bit of bifurcation, not bifurcation, we, will, we are seeing a big range of experiences. I think the word you used to use was grim, actually. But anyway, um, the, the other thing you were saying is that you believe that where technology is, is, is very interesting as well is breaking down the silos that education has traditionally been built around. Maybe could you talk about um, one of your courses, the sustainability leadership, and how you think that that type of course breaks down silos? Sure. So, um, you know, many courses are, um, you know, I spent many years as a management consultant and, and, you know, the root cause of many problems is actually silo based thinking. And it's the, get, the ability to people to, um, to, to talk to each other. And uh, universities and business schools are not exempt from that. Um, to, for most faculty, any problem, most problems can be looked at through the lens of perhaps their discipline, probably their latest book, or almost certainly their next book. Um, that's um, uh, not helpful. And we know that you know, in, in your, indeed in your conference, this, in our conference this week, issues such as sustainability, climate change, um, supply chain, finance, um, even family offices. You know, these are complex areas and require people to collaborate across disciplines. Climate has been the most um, obvious one. So in our sustainability program, um, we're bringing people together from, we're bringing academics and indeed uh, uh, practitioners from industry um, and, and regulators together from uh, several disciplines in science, in finance, in, I guess the discipline would be organizational behavior, but, but um, uh, uh, around culture. So the ability to bring many, many different peoples together is absolutely critical. Okay, great. Well, moving on to um, Christina. Uh, Christina, who's the Senior Director of um, Policy and Research Programs at the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, APRU. Um, prior to that was at the Royal College of Art and the University of Kent. Um, APRU is, is a, Christina, APRU really focuses on research universities. That's, that's correct, isn't it? Yeah, that's correct. So we are a network of now 61, um, we call them leading universities, research universities, an old position around the, uh, actually around the APEC region, around the, the Pacific Rim and uh, our university members are based in, um, at latest count, I would say 19 economies. Okay. And in your sphere, did the, did the crisis with the pandemic accelerate the use of technology, would you say, such as, for example, video conferencing and acceptance of it as the new normal for the way that people communicated and, and dealt with each other? Okay, yes. I mean, let me 
let me just explain really quickly because when I say we are a network of 60 universities, some people get very excited and others fall, fall asleep immediately because they, they think, oh, what is this in our network of universities? But the, the reason why we exist and we were set up uh, over 20 odd years ago um, is to bring um, networks of um, academic experts together to collaborate um, across our network and with external partners and support governments in addressing some of the challenges of the region. So um, as the way we do this is through setting up what I call research related program areas where we bring the researchers together, build a network, and then we have our external partners. And then we, we try to um, get researchers to feed in and provide some um, um, solutions or insights how governments can address, for example, climate change or global health or population aging or what it may be, um, for example. So um, as such, for us, collaboration across our universities has been really important. And yes, you've already pointed out communication. So we, I used to travel probably twice a month uh, within those 19 economies. Um, since I, you know, before the pandemic, and either hosting uh, research conferences or on projects that were funded, or what it may collaborations, or whatever it may be, and uh, this is not possible anymore. But um, so, as such technology has enabled us to continue working. So we've pivoted and really have brought a lot of our activities online into a virtual environment. But I have to say, we have already one of our strong um, engagement opportunity is with students because they're the future leaders of tomorrow. So these students, we are already talking to and raising awareness on these issues that we're talking about because they will at some point, give it five years or 10 years, they will be the people that have to address these and try and sort of, you know, get temperatures down or keep them down to one, 1. 1.5 degrees in, increase, not to two or whatever it may be. So even five and six years ago, we already started developing online courses where we brought together students across our network from the US, from China, from Japan, from Korea, from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from Mexico to um, learn on, for example, global health leadership and global health ethics. But the challenges was that it was very difficult to get our university members to sign up to these. The students were, they were really enthusiastic and we had fantastic feedback from students, but it was hard to get like five university cohorts of say, let's say five or 10 or 15 students to commit um, to get to come on this credit, credit band graduate course. The pandemic has completely changed this. We now have universities knocking on our doors and saying, I want to do this global health course. It is a synchronous and does it has both synchronous um, learning with experts from global health across the region, but also clearly learning and where students have to get together outside of the course, do their own studies, but also then work in groups with their other colleagues and other from Malaysia and Indonesia and the US and whatever it may be. And we have also now other um, universities that are leading other of our programs, our um, sustainable waste management program, for example, or the same citizen landscape program. They've joined forces with Nanyang Technology University in Singapore, and they're developing a, a sustainable, a global sustainability course on the same premise, for example. Without- That works as a simulation, the students play, do roles. Ah, uh, that's a different, yeah, that we've also done this. So, <laughs> yes, sorry, I could talk about this for hours. But uh, technology has enabled us to do many things. So bring together credit bearing courses that are, that are very exciting. You can maybe see my excitement about this. And it's not um, technology. I mean, virtual learning sounds awful, I think, possibly. But it can be very exciting if you develop it. And um, I think, David, you mentioned it already. It has to be done in a, in a good way. And I mean, actually, all the colleagues have talked, spoken about it. Brian, you mentioned it, and Chris, also you talk about your own technology, but it's about how you design it and how you then also design it for the audience that you have. And so you don't lose the students, but they are engaged, basically. So the simulation that you've just mentioned, Chris, is, um, sorry, Stephen, is, uh, where we, it's not to do with credits or anything like this. It's a 
where students come together and it's about raising awareness of climate change, for example. And again, we've bring together, we've brought uh, together 13 universities across our network on this. They brought 120 students in and we have allowed them to experience how the UN negotiates. So we've brought in experts from UN Habitat and from the outset, and we've had some tools, some virtual tools, where they then um, put, were together in um, groups like China and the US and SIDS and um, developing countries, for example. And then they tried to negotiate to keep the temperature at to 1.5 degrees increase only, which they didn't manage. But it was fantastic. They, were, they had a really good feedback, and so we will continue doing this. And only technology allows us to do that. Can you, can you talk, Christina, about the success of your virtual student exchange program? Yes, I can indeed. Yes. Um, so that's another thing that's um, so after we in last year in March, April, when we realized that we all had to pivot like everybody else did, we had like we, we, we are not going to meet anybody this year. So we started working with our members uh, on these ideas. What can we do? to ensure that our students and as well as our academics can continue working together and collaborate. And one key component for universities, for um, research universities all over the world, I'm sure, or universities in general, is internationalization of students. So that students travel from what, you know, they may go for a semester to another university, they may do maybe a year at another university, they come back and they gain this experience of a different culture and an understanding. But this was clearly, this is lost now, it was lost. And very quickly our members um, realized that something had to be done and we, we realized that something had to be done. So uh, last year we set up uh, the virtual student exchange um, program is led um, and is really ably led by uh, Hong Kong, a Chinese university in Hong Kong. And uh, has we've developed it as an undergraduate offering, and has two components. One is uh, again an academic component, so students maybe from let's say the US can still go and study for a semester at Korea University or study for a semester at um, at one of the Japanese members or so on, or vice versa. Um, or you know, students from Malaysia could can study continue studying at UCLA. Um, through this platform that we've set up and through universities putting forward their courses. But a big component of this is also the cultural exchange and the cultural experiences that have been lost. So where we've called on our members to put forward offerings that are of a, not of an academic nature, and that has been quite a challenge. It's Mariana, has, you highlighted that here in Asia, academic um, is very important. That's why we've got the academic component, but also the cultural, exchange is, is equally important, we feel. So students experience different cultures and, ex and have an understanding and again, um, yeah, increase their understanding of what it means to live in a global community, basically. And so we've um, had courses from the Galapagos, from our members in Latin America and the Galapagos Islands. We've had courses on uh, uh, Hong Kong cooking, Cantonese cooking, basically. Uh, we've had courses on uh, going to Disneyland, and these are um, they're all free and they're not academic courses, but they're courses of bringing students together um, in to experience other cultures and also to engage with students from other cultures. And it's been highly successful, but we'll see if it continues beyond COVID. We'll see. That, that's all great. I mean, I, I think you can hear the passion coming through from all of our panelists talking about these subjects. And, and uh, that's possibly why my time management's been so bad that we've now uh, gone way beyond the half an hour I initially said. But anyway, let, let's get on to more of a sort of um, group discussion where everyone can, can actually jump in and, and give their views on, on broader themes and topics around this ed tech um, big picture theme. What, one of the things that did come up um, when we were all talking prior to this session and I was talking to you all about your areas of expertise is there were different views as to the question of will virtual reality prove revolutionary to education? Um, and I wondered whether um, who would like to start off on that question of whether whether VR is a, a game changer for education in areas like medicine or whether it's, it's um, a dead end. So 
Sorry, who would want to go first? Oh, Chris. After you, Chris. Sure. No, I was just. I, I. I think you know when we're when we're looking at a when we're looking across all industries. Um, I've seen scenarios. You know, medicine, for example, Stephen, you mentioned. Um, there's a great uh, a great up and coming small company called Axon Global who are making these VR simulations for re repetitive uh, process. So processes that you develop a muscle memory around. So for example, like a sanitary process in, in medicine and it's been hugely successful, but you know, I think to confine the potential of VR within VR um, rather than thinking about also augmented and extended reality, I, I, I think it's, you know, we don't really know where all of those are gonna really land. Um, we're also, you know, obviously terms like metaverse are something that have been regularly mentioned recently. You know, I would, you know, and obviously there's people are making a natural connection to virtual reality. Your device hurdle for virtual reality is incredibly high. Um, and so there are also still, there still remain very unknown medical effects of ex prolonged exposure to virtual reality. So that's another, another consideration. I think driving virtual reality too far where we are at the moment, um, you are, you know, again, you're, you're, you're at risk of potentially further driving uh, you know, and some un unintended uh, inequalities um, when a lot of the basics around the world already haven't been put in place. And then the final, uh, the final piece of this, when we are thinking about this kind of, you know, this metaverse future, is right now we want to think, okay, if this is where it's where it's going to sit, you know, what does the data and the information that surrounds that look like, and who and where does that data lie? Um, because that's a, again, are we are, the, are we going to look at decentralized systems of data and information around virtual learning, or are we going to be looking at centralized systems of data and learning. So I think the policy, the device, everything's got a long way to go. Um, and I would question with VR at the moment, is it actually a priority? Um, and, and so I think we'll, we, we, we'll see where we land, but uh, yeah. David, did you want to add something? I agree with, uh, with, with Chris's comment. I, I think that the uh, challenge with new technologies is to be uh, intoxicated with the technology. I think we have to start a learning, you know, start with the end in mind. What are we looking to achieve? Uh, and then design back from, design back from that, given uh, accessibility, cost, um, um, too much time on, uh, on, on screens. So I think we'll see some experimentation. I, mean, I think that's what we're seeing a lot. Um, my current sense is that most learning designers haven't mastered some of the existing technologies that uh, we've all been talking about. So I'm not sure we need to layer on more and more complex and expensive technologies. Mariana, did you see lots of money going into the VR space in terms of China? Yes, I think so. I mean, as I, I kind of uh, alluded to earlier about the teaching resources kind of distribution, right? I think um, another good thing about technology is it's really helping with uh, shortening the proximity. I don't think flying over to, for example, like Xi'an is look at all, a lot of historical sites in China would be feasible for a lot of the general public. But then if the VR actually could actually open up the door, um, I think that's really a good thing. Um, they all, whatever, definitely is um, allocation going to VR, but I think once the technologies get to a, a pretty good stage, I, I would see that the, um, the government will also allocate some budgets to support that because that really would be in line with what we're trying to do, right? To, to lift up and, and level the battlefield for you know, everybody um, in terms of education and ensure that everyone gets the equal opportunities. So I see that from that angle. But pilot money is going to VR too. And Brian, are you, are you um, a big proponent of VR? Um, wherever it adds value, I think David had the point. What, what's the learning outcome? And, you know, um, I, I think one of the problems you've got, you know, with, with you know, distance learning or digital learning is the hands-on, which you can't have, you know. So if you're doing something, we'll say, with mechanical, well, you have to be in a room with the machines. Well, the second best thing to that would be to have a virtual reality so you can actually put on your headpiece and you can actually go and look at things and move things. So I think in certain, certain um, how would you say, um, 
programs, um, virtual reality would be helpful, but I don't really see it, we'll say, in, in business. Um, you know, um, you can have, we'll say, augmented reality, or you, you know, you can, you know, um, use a lot of tools that already exist. But it, in some areas, it will be, it will be very helpful. But again, how, you know, maybe it'll make things more efficient. So people, as you say, that can't go to places, can't see things, can experience it in a virtual way, that would help, yeah. But still, you have to look at the outcomes of the learning and ask, because all technology is a tool, are tools to help us. And we have to look at, you know, are they add, adding value in the right way? Christina, is, is AFRU looking at incorporating VR into future programs? Is that something you're looking at as well? No, not currently, but what I would like, just wanted to mention, I just had a conversation with a, a colleague from AWS actually <laughs> the other day, they wanted to sponsor for our programs and she said, oh, um, she even said uh, one and a half years ago, she didn't know what Zoom was, you know, it's like now everybody knows Zoom. And this was because of the need that there, there was to, to start to have a technology that will connect us all. And I'm sure there are others and whatever it may be, but, um, and I think the same will be for virtual reality. I think that a lot of money will go into it and the technology won't stop. There will, people will continue developing it, but it depends what will happen and where it will land, I think will depend as little, certain on the, on the uh, global or the macro context, basically where the need is. And I mean, I could, you know, Xi'an, yeah, I could imagine that'd be great for VR, but there may well, something else may happen um, or another big player may come in and push it and then, you know, once it's there, it's not going to go away again. Like, our virtual learning won't go away either. I think another exciting area of technology that came up in the discussions we were having beforehand, uh, the, the pre-discussions to this, this panel, was the possibilities of artificial intelligence, AI, and simultaneous translation. And how, I mean, I know, David, for example, we talked about your view that it, this is happening quite rapidly now in terms of you could you could actually have someone from um, I don't know um, the middle of Africa who who's following one of your courses because it's simultaneously translated into their native language from English um, real time. That would be the future, and that's where the things are going. How how big a game changer is AI and simultaneous translation going to be for the education sector? Um, I, I think very substantially, it's going to change the economics. Of, um, um, of course, creation, where if we have many, many more learners, um, it will make it more profitable and aff affordable to develop uh, new content. Um, so I think that's terrifically, and at different levels. So uh, what the example you gave of, simul of simultaneous translation, um, as you get more technical, sometimes the translation suffers some. So, uh, so that can be quite tricky. But also in the face-to-face, -face where um, uh, you know, we have um, sometimes a lot of sort of seventy executives in a room, and um, we they can be coming from a couple of different languages, and we can we actually have these you know, simultaneous translation going on, and where previously we, we I mean I trying to get a theme across of access and, and, and diversity. And in some countries, um, uh, access to English is a barrier to, uh, to accessing a large quantities of learning. And if we can reduce that barrier, then that is a very good thing for, uh, for companies, for individuals and indeed society. Chris, coming at this from a, a technologist point of view, do you, do you think we're moving rapidly towards this, this sort of landscape where we get rid of the Tower of Babel and everything can be simultaneously translated seamlessly by, by AI? So I, I think I, I, I would applaud, um, I, do, I do applaud you know, any moves forward in automation of translation. I think that's a fantastic thing. I think, you know, the route to, un, to, common, understand, to, uh, to common understanding is often through, through language and you know, that references back to that Tower of Babel reference. But, you know, one, one thing I don't think can be necessarily understated is there's a, there's a big difference between something being translated and something being localized. And so where a lecturer is in one country 
and they are giving a referenceable or an inspirational example, that might well not be an inspirational example to another country. And so I think, you know, I, I, I do believe right now, you know, having simultaneous translation, hey, you know, I, I any form of translation to educational content becomes a form of version control. Um, if we're thinking of content through different types of device, then we are also then thinking about version control, call it an exponential growth of versioning within, within content and within products. So yes, laudable, great, but I do think that those cultural aspects and that localization needs to be, needs to be understood. The fact, if, an a, if, if simultaneous localization from artificial intelligence could come through, I think that would be an absolutely fantastic thing. Now, what's interesting though, obviously a lot of the development in uh, this simultaneous translation is coming from the, 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 the development or the, the sophistication or growth of neural networks. And one thing that's, that's quite cool at the same time as that is we're seeing the capability of, of, of neural network processing shrinking down into smaller and smaller devices. And so perhaps that means smaller devices, perhaps it means more accessible devices. So again, coming back to that thing of connectivity, of access to the, to the benefits of these kinds of, these kinds of, uh, of, of, of innovations, um, you know, it's something to, it's, we are seeing these converge, but I, I, I again, return to localization. Um, I would say at the moment, Microsoft's probably got the best example of, uh, with immersive, immersive readers, a pretty good example um, with, you know, with Microsoft. So if you live transcribe and then you plug immersive reader, you can, you can fundamentally simultaneously translate at a very incredibly low cost with minimal engineering. But um yeah, I, I think it's going places, but I, I don't think we could, can ignore the cultural significance of translation. OK, I mean, we could talk about this subject literally for the rest of the day for hours and hours to, get, to come. It's such a big, big philosophical topic. But um, I, I guess I have to ask everyone on the panel after our discussion today, you know, in a hypothetical situation where you were sitting down with a, a regulator in the Asia region, what would be the, the one, one or two policy recommendations you might give to that regulator about the ed tech sector um, based on what we've been talking about today? Maybe Brian, you could start. Um, thank you. Well, that is something I actually do um, in my role. Um, I, 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 think, I think it's important to realize, you know, like for any, you know, like for a country like Vietnam, the only way to success is to embrace this. Um, and to try and use it as effectively as possible. And um, to, you know, the regulators need to look at um, implementing uh, you know, the laws that make, you know, that make digital education um, a lot more accessible. You know? And th that's only happened in recent years. You know? um, online learning wasn't recognized in Vietnam a few years ago, as, uh, but now they're beginning to realize that, yeah, if you want to keep the, if, if you want to keep the economy competitive, you have to grab and utilize whatever technology is out there. So there is a big push there. But yeah, it's I, I, I talking about uh, what is it called, King Canute? You know, turning back the tide. Well, you can't turn it back. It's not going to come back. It's going to go forward. And for any economy, for any government in the world. Um, and I think Mariana mentioned it at the beginning, and Vietnam's not that different to China in the value of education and giving the kids the best education. Um, that's what they're going to look for. And in the future, um, parents of kids in Vietnam are going to say, well, maybe, maybe we can go to David's institution in London and learn online and get the best education there, or one of Christina's or whatever. But yeah, you, you have to, look at technology and say, if we don't use this in the best possible way, other people will and they will get ahead of us. And I think um, a lot of governments around the world realize that you either change, adapt or get left behind. Mariana, what would you say to the regulator? regulator? I'm very interested in this uh, answer. 
I think would be um, keep an open mind. I think I think we are in the process of coming up with regulatory changes, not only in education, right? I think we have seen along the headlines, right, in, in newspapers around a lot of the sectors also getting a lot of regulatory changes in China. I think the government is in the process of kind of designing and, and ensuring that country is growing at more sustainable long-term development path. Um, so I think I think um, along the way, we have to find a way to build an ecosystem whereby the corporates will actually kind of benefit from the investments in education, like through talents, you know, better talents in the market and, and uh, better returns in their kind of investments on the innovation. Uh, I think a lot of the markets in Hong Kong, I think at least we have the science part, you know, initiatives like this where the government and education and corporates can be cut under together. So it will be more of a win-win situation. But um, I think it's, of course, a little bit easier to do as, for Hong Kong as a city, but for China, um, the mainland China is a huge country. So I think it takes some time to decide that. But um, I think we just have to find a way to ensure that everyone benefits together. So we will have um, a kind of strike a good balance among all the stakeholders. But yeah, I think keep an open mind for, for attack overall. I think it would be um, helpful for all. Yeah, and Christina, this is obviously a question that obviously must be very close to your heart too. And what would you, your recommendations be? Well, to be honest, I think um, following from Brian, um, you talked about digital skills and talked to the governments about um, making sure that this is on top of the agenda. I'd say capacity building, but infrastructure also, the infrastructure needs to be there because um, yes, it, technology has a, is a, has the opportunity to be a real game changer and leveling the playing field a little bit that has been mentioned already about the inequity that has education, especially leading universities and institutions um, ha have created. And I think uh, policy needs to catch up on this one. Governance needs to need to actually be enablers that this let this happen to let the um, the, the people that maybe otherwise would have not they have the opportunity to actually pick up these these opportunities and and catch up and develop and maybe take over others that you know where, where they would have not had the chance before so that's that's what i would think and then um, the advice would be very different for governments around their regions depending where you are hong kong korea japan whatever malaysia and so on of course a, a very different advice for different governments but yeah. um any any, um, any big points you would make, David? So um, companies and countries consistently say people are our most important <laughs> asset. And it's simply not true, judged by their behaviour. So um, we... And I'd, so I'd like to draw an analogy between the sustainability discussions that we're having at the moment. It is partially that the world in some countries and varying levels there's a whole mindset change around sustainability, and that is translating in places into action, personal, corporate, societal level, governmental level. And I think we need a similar approach the, to, uh, to, to capability building, which needs to be much more joined up around um, you know, private institution, educational institutions, um, uh, and regulation. So I, I would think regulators are a part of that. So I would encourage a slightly different attitude because we are seeing, you know, there's been work a few years ago now um, uh, around the digital divide. And I fear without a real embrace that many countries and many people who don't get some of the skills that Chris is um, helping create from the bottom up, but we also need other interventions, um, it's going to be very challenging for some areas of society. And Chris, you, your your viewpoint in terms of uh, for coming from the software side, where where would you say that you face challenges with regulations in the region? So, I mean, to be honest, from a software perspective, I, I don't see that much of a of a challenge in terms of you know software is something well designed software that's well supported uh, is something that we we find uh, educators quite willing to 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 adopt. However. If I was saying to, you know, I've got two things. One of these is low hanging. One of them is a moonshot. Um, thinking about the men, possibly the mentality of policymakers. Um, when I'm thinking about the the first, the reality is train your educators. You know, we need we need one, and 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 actually goes back to um, to David's point before as well about silos. You know, there's no greater silo than the silo between education and the real world. 
No, that is a, a very, those are two very sad silos. So, you know, and if we're talking about, we're talking about talent gaps and we're talking about investing in devices and all of that, but so, so often there is a complete miss in the investment in educators. You know, it strikes one of the things I've always scratched my head in Hong Kong is where we have a start me up conference that has no vertical in education. Last year, during the pandemic, we had a vertical in retail, but none in education. That, to me, says that the policymakers need a very, very severe reality check. Now, um, so one, train your educators. Get your educators into the mindset of the context of the real world. Because another key element, which is a challenge, are the outcomes of learning from education are rarely understood by the business world. The, the way we explain what we know from education is not explained in a way that the business world understands. But we need to bring educators into the context of the commercial world for a more unified taxonomy to be created. So that's one. My moonshot is reform assessment. Because at the moment, we assess our, la our first language and we assess mathematics, neither of which have a strong strongly comprehensible connect, uh, contextual connection to the real world. We need, but we, we're not going to be able to really slot other areas into that until we reform the way that that, that fundamental assessment is. Hong Kong context, Not first language, mathematics. After that, the chance of a student studying digital skills comes out statistically about one in 20 because they will choose from a load of other things. So, but that's because the technology isn't assessed as a core requirement of graduating from high school. So that's my, but you know, assessment is controversial. Assessment's going to take time. And if you look at the, if you're a policymaker and you're looking at the economics of this situation, if you're in a Japan situation and you've got an aging population, then you are going to, you need everyone gainfully employed because that's the only way you're going to fundamentally pay your medical bill. If you're in an India situation, you need everyone gainfully employed because you're trying to grow your way out of poverty. And underneath that, the robots and the automation can grow as much as it wants. But, you know, and that's the, this is the thing without the, if we don't create the talent, if we don't bridge that, if we don't bring everyone to that table, 50% is not enough. If we don't bring everyone to that table, the models that we have for the countries that we live in today will not be economically sustainable. And so that's. You know, that's why I put second one I see as a moonshot as long term training educators, valuing educators as something we could start doing tomorrow. Wonderful. I like the idea of ending on a moonshot. It's a very appropriate thing to do. Um, we're out of time now, but I'd like to thank all of the, the panelists for sharing all of their uh, deep insights and experience with us today. And I think it's been a fairly broad ranging discussion that could have gone on, frankly, for a few more hours. But unfortunately, we're going to have to uh, curtail it here. Um, Hopefully we raised enough uh, issues to get people thinking. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, it's been a really good discussion. Um, Michael? And I just wanted to also um, flag for tomorrow, there's gonna be another um, session seven, um, a dialogue on the, the resilient supply chain in APAC. What does that mean? That starts at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, so, um, look out for that as well. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, panelists. Uh, what a, I, I mean, literally been writing notes. I wish I had a bot that could actually automatically do it, but I still am a handwriting notepad kind of guy. Um, what a fantastic uh, conversation. And I think Chris ended on a, on a key area because it, it seems the governments do listen to the academics probably too much in that respect. <laughs> so, um, of course, it should be a, a, a tripod in terms of bringing business more and more into it as well. And uh, obviously the NGO environment. So more of more of that collaboration. Uh, you know, the academics may not necessarily have all of the answers for the business world, as Chris has highlighted there. Uh, but I think bringing everyone together, we can have better policies uh, to bridge both the national and international uh, minefield. That is what you brought up, the, the moonshot of trying to change assessments which uh, I think uh, it's not just in this sector we're going to have uh, be talking about reform in global institutions as well like WTO so reform is a key word as we come out of Covid crisis in many areas so thank you once again 
and uh, we'll leave it there and uh, have a good evening. Okay. Good evening. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. All right. Thank See you, everybody.